Now, the other dimension of productivity mm -hmm. is, is the human being. Human capital, right. education, nutrition, right. health care. Yes. How did this come on stream in the economics? Well, Marshall thought that education was going to be the great, you know, the, the great accelerator of productivity improvements. And um, he thought that, you know, business would drive productivity, but why not make it fast? You know, was there a way to make it faster? And, and he, that was education, both in the sense of sending children of the working class to school, and which was a very, very controversial idea. Why? Because, because it might make them dissatisfied with their station in life. And the whole, thing, the whole thing before had been that you need to adjust to your station in life. Okay. Not, yeah. not well, move, this is quite threatening not to be, that notion. Not, not yeah. move beyond it. Marshall also, you know, he, he came, went, went to the United States and he spent about uh, three months traveling around and, again, you know, visiting um, businesses, talking to workers, employers, trade you, and he, he also realized that there were lots of other things that that um, you know that workers could do and were doing, such as emigrating, such as moving from um, uh, you know old industries to new industries, acquiring new skills. Because he um, you know in sort of diametric opposition to Marx, who you know who um, thought that the labor market would uh, sort of push everyone down, you know, rob them of their skill and push everyone down. Marshall, who was a, um, a really great empiricist and observer, as, you know, um, uh, realized that, wait a minute, the opposite is happening. There's a huge way between the semi-skilled and the, you know, Unskilled. Uh, day, day laborer. The, um, the white collar, um, um, you know, the, the clerk class and, and the day laborer. So that there were all these ways and that, and that was the, that was why, uh, you know, the business had to, um, you know, had to compete for, you know, higher skilled labor and there was, a, you know, this, a mechanism that ensured that the gains were going to be shared. And that was, you know, that was the kind of thing that, that made economics before Marshall was about what you couldn't do, you know, and what you better adjust yourself to. And after Marshall, it was about what you could do. So Marshall was the person who proved Dickens' intuition was right. That's right. That's right. And he made, econ you know, he made economics not a set of specific conclusions or an ideology, but rather this engine of analysis, so that um, um, you know that could be you know that was going to be innovated and improved over time, and that was the. That's a major contribution. And, it's uh, huge. Who brought government into the picture? Is this part of this well, productivity <laughs> cooperative well, game? Where, how did that come to be? Well, this debutante who was really supposed to, um, uh, who ne never went to school, you know, she was very rich and very beautiful, and she was like her seven or eight sisters, destined to marry a powerful, you know, businessman or politician. Her name was Beatrice Potter. Later. Beatrice Webb. People confuse her with Beatrix Potter, but not the same person. Her mother had a very good friend, Herbert Spencer, who was a very odd, very odd man, but in some ways very lovely. And he took Beatrice under his wing and encouraged her to become, to create for herself the role of social investigator. The idea was that if you're going to have social reform, you need to do it on the basis of, it's like evidence-based social reform. <laughs> that was, you know, that was the idea. And, you know, she started out as a 
you know, minim minimal government, you know, the government shouldn't intervene in anything. And she um, uh, became, you know, did some investigative journalism. And when uh, in the sort of radical, you know, reform upheaval of the 1890s, um, she uh, became, um, kind of went to the socialist side and they then proceeded to invent the think tank and the idea of the welfare state. Okay, the idea that, that the government was responsible for providing a floor under the living standards of every citizen. And, you know, it wasn't as if no one had ever had that idea. Uh, the, the but charitable first of all, notion. But nobody thought it could work. The, the socialists, you know, the people like Marx, of course, said, impossible, the ruling class will never, you know, uh, do anything genuine that way. And the, um, the people who understood that the private sector was the source and driver behind productivity were afraid that, that you know, taxation and and provision to a segment of the poor would undermine growth. So she, but she had a very brilliant supply side argument, which she, you know, documented and, and argued for very brilliantly, which was that the, uh, the bottom third of uh, the British population was so debilitated that, um, that you know, poverty was breeding poverty. You know, uh, they couldn't take care of their kids, they couldn't work, they were sick, and that by providing a minimum standard of living, a lot of these people would become productive citizens, okay? And that idea, um, uh, by the time um, Winston Churchill went into politics, and gave up his, you know, Tory um, affiliation to become a liberal. By that time, um, uh, she was, um, you know, he was one of her protégés. And the liberal government of 1908, which was Lloyd George and, uh, and Churchill, uh, you know, passed some of the first, you know, the first welfare state legislation. Mm -hmm.